Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Original sin, also described as ancestral sin, is the Christian doctrine that says humans through birth inherit a nature tainted with sin and with inclination to, to sinful conduct. Many Christians today, particularly members of the Anglican, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian churches, and some Orthodox churches or Christians subscribe to this belief. They maintain that the sin of Adam was transferred to all future generations, tainted even the, tainting even the unborn. There are also few churches who reject the concept. The biblical basis for the belief is generally found in Genesis 3, the story of expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Also in uh, Psalms 51.5, which says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And in Paul's letter to the Romans 5, 12 through 21, Therefore, just as through one man sins and sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Original sin defines the nature of mankind's sinful condition because of Adam's fall. It teaches that all people are corrupted by Adam's sin through natural generation by which together with Adam's imputed condemnation we all enter the world guilty. Original sin shows that we sin because we are sinners, entering this world with a corrupt nature and without hope, apart from the saving grace of God in the gospel and the Christ. Original sin first considers our connection with Adam in the universal guilt of mankind, that is, when Adam sinned, the entire human race was in him so that his guilt accrued to all of us. Christianity believes that only through the acceptance of Jesus that the grace of God can return to man and that a Christian need only believe in Jesus to be saved. In other words, Adam, who disobeyed God in eating the forbidden fruit, and in consequence transmitted his sin and guilt by heredity to his descendants. Then, according to Britannico, we see the doctrine has its basis in the Bible. It adds, although the human condition, suffering, death, and universal tendency towards sin is accounted for by the story of the fall of Adam in the early chapters of the book of Genesis, the Hebrew scriptures say nothing about the transmission of hereditary sin to the entire human race. In the Gospels also, there are no more than allusions to the notion of the fall of man and universal sin. The main scriptural, scriptural affirmation of the doctrine is found in the writings of St. Paul, particularly in Romans 5, 12 through 19, a difficult passage in which Paul establishes a parallelism between Adam and Christ, stating that whereas sin and death entered the world through Adam, grace and eternal life have come in greater abundance through Christ. According to Britannica, the Doctoring has long been the prerequisite for the Christian understanding of the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion and atonement and was specially propagated by St. Augustine in the West. Despite its importance for understanding Jesus' sacrifice and as a motivation behind the practice of infant baptism in some churches, the doctrine of original sin has been minimized since the European Enlightenment. Indeed, the idea that 
salvation is necessary because of the universal stain of original sin is no longer accepted by a number of Christian sects and interpretations, especially among those Christians who consider the story of Adam and Eve to be less a fact and more a metaphor of the relation of God um, and humanity. According to Daniel Pate in the Cambridge Dictionary of Christianity and Frank Cross in the Oxford Dictionary of Christian Church, this belief began to emerge in the third century but only became fully formed with the writings of Augustine of Hippo, 354 through 430 AD, who was the first author to use the phrase original sin. According to his book, The Original Sin, Origins, Development, and Contemporary Meanings, page 56, Taha Wiley says, influenced by Augustine, the Council of Carthage, 411 through 418 AD, and Orange, 529 AD, brought the theological speculation about original sin into the official lexicon of the church. With this introduction on doctrine of original sin, and before we get into the analysis, we ask what about other faiths like Islam and Judaism? Do they have a comparable doctrine? What is the Islamic and Quranic view? What about the logical point of view? Does the argument for original sin make sense? The term original sin is unknown in other faiths, especially in Islam and Judaism. Nothing even comparable. We will briefly look at original sin from Judaism and Islamic point of view first, then on to Christianity itself and details about the original sin, while we will contrast with the Old and New Testaments, as well as the Quranic text. Judaism rejects the idea of original sin as it believes that humans enter the world free of sin with a soul that is pure and untainted. While there were some Jewish teachers in Talmudic times who believed that death was a punishment brought upon mankind on account of Adam's sin, the dominant view by far was that man sins because he is not a perfect being. Furthermore, due to free will, goodness is not impossible, only difficult at times. According to Genesis 4-7, people can master their evil or sinful inclinations and according to Psalms 37-27, choose good over evil. According to Daniel 4-27, you can renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. In Genesis 4, 6-7, Six through seven, God counsels Cain and says, If you do good, that is, change your ways, will it not be lifted up? That is, you will be forgiven. But if you do not do good, sin rests at your door and it desires you, but you may rule over it. Where God informs Cain and, and that repentance and subsequent forgiveness are always open to him. Now, on to Islam and the Qur'an, where there is no such thing as original sin. According to the last revelation or final testament, the Qur'an, which remains intact since its revelation, man has free will and can choose to do righteous or sinful deeds. He has the potential to do both as he wills. A person always has the power to avoid sin and its negative effects. Islamic approach to Adam, peace be upon him, the concept of sin, atonement, and man's free will is very rational, factual, and resonates with human nature as follows. Five points. Number one, according to Islamic tradition, while Adam, 
and Eve ate from the tree based on Satan or Shaitan's whispering and their free will, but they immediately repented and asked for God's forgiveness. And they were forgiven, as we are informed in the Quran, in chapter 20. فَوَسْوَسَ إِلَيْهِ الشَّيْطَانُ قَالَ يَا آدَمْ هَلْ أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى شَجَرَةٍ الْخُلْدِ وَمُلْكٍ لَا يَبْلِ Then Satan or Shaitan whispered to him, he said, O oh Adam, shall I direct you to the tree of eternity and kingdom that never decays? In another verse, Shaitan tells them, Your Lord did not forbid you this tree, lest you become angels or become among the immortals. It follows in the next verse of chapter 20 that Adam and his wife ate from the tree as they both, not just Eve, disobeyed their Lord and erred. Then, through next verse, in chapter 2, we learn his Lord chose Adam and turned to him in forgiveness and guided him. Then God accepted his repentance, and indeed it is he who is the accepting of repentance, the merciful. This is significant because even for Adam and his wife, this sin was erased immediately. So there's no sin to be inherited, even if it was inheritable. After his forgiveness, we see in chapter 2 again that Allah said to them, Descend from paradise, all your descendants being enemy to one another. And if there should come to you guidance from me, then whoever follows my guidance will never go astray in this world, nor suffer in the hereafter. In other words, the key here is the guidance, not the sin of Adam. Whoever takes God's guidance shall not live in a life of sin, regardless of whether his forefathers live, lived in sin or righteousness. We have examples of even prophets such as Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, whose father was an idolater who lived a life of sin. Yet his son became not only a monotheist, but a prophet of God. On the opposite, we have Noah, Nuh alayhi salam, who is a prophet of God, yet his son lives a life of sin as an idolater. One son took the guidance based on free will, and the other did not. And that was the reason for his sin, not his genealogy. Number two, according to Islam, everyone is born innocent. Every baby, every child is innocent and only becomes accountable when he or she reaches an age where they can distinguish the difference between right and wrong, generally at the age of puberty. Number three, According to the Qur'an, God created mankind in best of stature and honored him. Through his free will and dedication to God, he has the potential to ascend to his completion, his excellence, to his humanity as intended by God. Or again, based on his free will and Satan's or Shaitan's temptation, he has the potential to descend to lowest of the low, even lower than animals, and immerse himself in sin, corruption, and transgression. That is the nature of free will. The Islamic view clearly renders a lofty position to human will as the cornerstone in man's covenant with God. Free will is also seen as the essence of man's responsibility and accountability. Man can attain a status higher than that of the angels by remaining through his fr uh, free will, true to his covenant with God, and by not yielding to his desires or surrendering to temptations. However, he can also debase himself 
by allowing his desires to get the better of his will and temptation to overcome fate and common sense and by neglecting his commitment toward God Almighty. Number four, if mankind was born with sin, meaning if sin was hereditary, then his whole life would be predestined or predetermined, and the concept of accountability would be meaningless. Man could say, I sinned because I was created this way or born to sin. God created man with free will, and every person is responsible and accountable for himself or herself. And as the Quran says, none can be burdened by the sins and actions of another because God has already put the discernment of good and bad in us, in our soul. And as a child, we don't quite have it, but as we grow, this discernment, this judgment of good and bad gets stronger. The Quran says in chapter 91, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا And by the soul and he who proportioned it. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And it inspired it with discernment of its wickedness and its righteousness. قَدْ أَفْلَهَمَنْ زَكَّاهَا He who purifies it, the soul, has succeeded. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And he who instills it with corruption has failed. Hence, it is I who choose to purify my soul or let it corrupt. As a result, I am solely responsible for my actions and the consequences, not anyone else, as the Quran explicitly says in uh, chapter 6, in chapter 6, وَلَا تَكْسِبُوا كُلُّ نَفْسٍ إِلَّا عَلَيْهَا وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ and every soul earns no blame except against itself, and no carrier of burden will carry the burden of another. Then to your Lord is your return. Indeed, no soul shall carry another's burden. We see a similar verse in chapter 53 as it says, Allah tazeru wa zaratun. That no carrier of burdens will carry the burden of another and that everyone shall have in his account only that which he worked for and that his effort is going to be seen. Then he will be recompensed for it in full payment. Meaning, nothing of a person's deed will ever be lost because nothing will be overlooked by God. Every action, no matter how small, will be valued by God's fine and accurate measure in order to recompense everyone in full. No one is credited with anything other than his own deeds. Even in our courts of law, you do not see a son pain for uh, his father's crime, or vice versa. In a court of law, every adult is responsible for themselves. I'm not accountable for the sin of my parents and their parents, nor are they for mine. As the Quran confirms in chapter 31, O mankind, keep your duty to your Lord and fear a day when no father will avail his son, nor will a son avail his father at all. Indeed, the promise of Allah is truth. And this makes sense. It is logical. Is mankind vulnerable? Of course. He can be influenced by his own soul, nafs, or shaitan, to do wrong things. But he's still in control and can choose a different path. That was the whole reason for sending the prophets and messengers with guidance. So people have the criterion, the standard, as to what is the right thing to do. 
and make a choice between right and wrong. Number five, in Islam, the forgiveness comes only from God by asking for his forgiveness with sincere repentance and mending one's ways. I can ask God to forgive me or my parents or a family member or a friend or anyone. It is called supplication, dua. However, I'm not held accountable for their actions, nor are they for mine. Not even prophets and messengers of God. There is no salvation through Jesus or any other prophet of God in Islam. Their role was to show us how to worship God alone, bring guidance to us, and give us glad tiding and warning of the consequences of our actions. It is ultimately our choice to take their guidance or not. That's it. Don't these five Quranic points make the ones we raise seem logical? These were brief Islamic and Jewish perspectives, and now following our introduction to original sin in the beginning, let's analyze and contrast from Christian perspective further. As indicated in the introduction, according to Britannica, from biblical perspective, although the human condition, suffering, death, and a universal tendency towards sin is accounted for by the story of the fall of Adam in the early chapters of the book of Genesis, the Hebrew scriptures say nothing about the transmission of hereditary sin to the entire human race. In the Gospels also, there are no more than allusions to the notion of the fall of man and universal sin. The main scriptural affirmation of this doctrine is found in the writings of Saint Paul and particularly in Romans 5, 12 through 19, a difficult passage in which Paul establishes a parallelism between Adam and Christ, stating that whereas sin and death entered the world through Adam, grace and eternal life have come in greater abundance through Christ. However, according to Cambridge Dictionary of Christianity and Frank Cross in the Oxford Dictionary of Christian Church, this thought, which was first injected by Paul years after uh, Jesus, did not emerge until the third century but only became fully formed with the writings of Augustine of Hippo over 300 AD, who was the first author to use the phrase original sin. So the whole doctrine does not originate at Jesus' time. According to Augustine's conversion from traditional free choice to non-free free will, a comprehensive methodology by Kenneth Wilson, Protestant reformers such as Martin Luther and John Calvin equated original sin with hurtful desire, affirming that it persisted even after baptism and completely destroyed freedom to do good, proposing that original sin involved a loss of free will except to sin. The Jansenist movement, which the Roman Catholic Church declared heretical in 1653, also maintained that original sin destroyed freedom of will, according to uh, Catholic uh, Encyclopedia, Volume 8. Instead, the Catholic Church declares that baptism, by imparting the life of Christ's grace, erases original sin and turns a man back toward God. But the consequence for nature, uh, consequences for the nature, inclination to evil, persist in man and summon him to spiritual battle according to counsel of Trent. In her interview with RNS, Danielle Schroyer, 
the author of the book Original Blessing, Putting Sin in Its Rightful Place, says, Scripture certainly talks about the universal reach of sin, but no passage or verse in Scripture speaks definitively to the concept of an inborn sin nature. We can take sin seriously without going there. After all, Jesus didn't believe in original sin, and the disciples and the early church didn't either. According to Schroer, who was pastor and Christian, now a writer, Jesus didn't believe this doctrine, and neither did the early church. And if Jesus didn't believe it, maybe we shouldn't either. When, he was, when she was asked, why is this doctrine so important that you felt you needed to write a book about it, she said, as a pastor and now a writer, I want to help people grow into a mature relationship with God. I just don't think original sin is helpful in doing that. In fact, I think it's very often harmful. The most faithful and centered people I know have a healthy sense of dignity and an honest view of their own shortcomings. And that's exactly what original blessing gives us. If you want short-term obedience, then scare or shame people. If you want transformation, anchor them to God's unconditional love. Here's the thing. People know they sin. What they don't know is what to do about it. I don't think the best answer is admitting you are irrevocably bad. Now, on to our analysis. Firstly, there is neither scientific, nor logical, nor original scriptural reason that if a father betrays a trust, then all his descendants, without exception, will inherit this character from him. Adam's disobedience was not like his skin color to be transferred to his children. It was his will, and his will belongs to him. Some children have different characters and even oppose their father's behavior. So the idea of natural and inherited sin is an incorrect and irrational thought. And to attribute it to glorious God is to invent a lie against his divine status, the Lord who is just and all wise. In addition, there is no explicit indication or even allusion of natural and inherited sin of man in the Old Testament, specifically Torah and the original gospel. As discussed, although this claim is seen by Paul's literary works many years after Jesus, followed by its full formation with the writings of Augustine over 300 years later, we notice that Jesus' words contradict this opinion because we see in the Gospels Jesus called children innocent and heavenly. As he used to say to disciples, you should be like children, innocent and humble, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is clear that if children were naturally sinful, the words of Jesus in following Gospels would not be true. However, it is the opposite. As we read in Matthew 18, 1 through 5, at the time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called the little child to him and placed the child among them and said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will, never enter, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. 
Similarly, in Mark 10, 13 through 16, we read, Then they brought little children to him, that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Certainly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child by no means will enter the kingdom. And he, he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Similarly, we see in Matthew 19, 13 through 15, and Luke 18, 15 through 17, and verses alike. Now, how could there be kingdom of heaven for children if they were tainted with the original sin? Rather, one sees that Jesus, peace be upon him, looked into the innocence and humbleness of children rather than looking into their faith in Trinity, um, uh, redemption. Jesus, peace be upon him, did not consider mankind to be sinful and treacherous by default, by nature, and did not attribute Adam's sin to all his children. We Muslims believe that if a father commits an evil act by his free will, no wise human judge will condemn his child, let alone God who is all wise and the just. We further believe whoever attributes such judgment to God has described him as unjust and disregarded God's glory as the Quran says in chapter 6, glorified is he and exalted above that which they attribute to him. Back to Paul and his doctrine of atonement, written in his letter to uh, Galatians 2.16, the notion that mankind is a race of wrongdoers, having inherited Adam's sin, and as a result of the original sin, man cannot serve as his own redeemer. His good works are no avail because man cannot satisfy the justice of God. Again, according to Paul, in his letter to Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Meaning, as a result of Adam's sin, man is doomed to die. However, by his death, Jesus took on the punishment, which was due to man. Jesus then conquered death and righteousness was restored. Despite the prominent place in Christianity, the notion of an original sin is not found among teachings of any prophet, Jesus included, as discussed earlier. In the Old Testament, for example, in Ezekiel 18.20, God says, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bears the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. In Genesis 1, God created everything in God's image and called it good. And in Matthew 5, Jesus says, humans are the light of the world capable of perfection. In the Quran, also we find a completely different philosophy on sin and personal responsibility. That which is rational and boils down to no soul shall carry burden of another soul, as discussed earlier. The Quran describes the basis on man's creation as the upright creation upon which he originated people. He has not burdened man with any original sin, having independently forgiven Adam and Eve, as we discussed in chapters 2 and 7. And a number of verses on how he forgives us. Verses like, Ask the forgiveness of your Lord and turn to him in repentance. Indeed, my Lord is the most merciful, the loving. 
the most merciful, the loving. Or say, all my worshippers, my servants, who have sinned excessively against themselves, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Surely, Allah forgives all sins. He is the forgiver, the most merciful. Turn to your Lord and surrender yourself to Him. In Islam, we are all personally responsible for our actions, confirmed by the verses like in chapter 2. Allah does not charge a soul except with that within its cap capacity. It will have the consequence of what good it has gained, and it will bear the consequence of what evil it has earned. Or say, is it other than Allah I should desire as a Lord, while He is the Lord of all things, and every soul earns no blame except against itself, and no carrier of burden will carry the burden of another. Then to your Lord is your return. In Islam, a person always has the power to avoid sin and its negative effects. There's no need for man-made saviors. Salvation comes from God alone. As the Quran says in chapter 28, but as for one who had repented, believed, and done righteousness, it is promised by Allah that he will be among the successful. In contrast, the doctrine of original sin gave Paul the means to justify polytheistic influence in his scheme of salvation. Lack of responsibility and inattention became hallmark of Christians who subscribed to this doctrine. As such, Paul effectively shifted the center of worship away from God by saying that Jesus was the divine agent of salvation, as in his letter Galatians 2.20. In doing so, he set aside all teachings of God's prophets and even the concept of monotheism itself, since God in Christianity needs Jesus for his divine helper. According to Rabbi Tovia Singer, he says, quote, As the author of Romans and Galatians, Paul constructed his most consequential doctrines on the premise that man is utterly depraved and therefore incapable of saving himself through his own obedience to God. In chapter after chapter, he directs his largely Gentile audiences toward the cross and away from Sinai. As he repeatedly insists that man is utterly lost without Jesus. Paul, however, should have been tipped off that his teachings on original sin were misguided and his broad-brushed characterization of humanity was without merit. In fact, the Jewish scriptures repeatedly praised numerous men of God for their unwavering righteousness. He then adds few examples of great men and kings mentioned in the Old Testament from the time before Jesus, one of whom being Job, Ayyub and says, these extraordinary men of God did not merit these remarkable superlatives because they believed in Jesus or depended on a blood atonement. Rather, Scripture testified to their faithfulness because of their devotion to God and unyielding obedience to His Torah. Job's unique Loyalty to God stands as a stunning paradox to Christian theology as well. Here was a man who was severely tested and endured unimag unimaginable personal tragedies, yet despite these afflictions, God, Job remains the model of the righteous servant of God. 
While in Christian theology, Job's personal spiritual triumph is a theological impossibility, in Jewish terms, it stands out as the embodiment of God's salvation program for mankind. Job didn't rely on Jesus to save him, and he certainly did not turn to the cross for his redemption. Rather, it was his obedience to God that made his life a paradigm for all humanity. Now, looking at this from logical point of view, Christians believe Jesus, peace be upon him, went to the cross and paid for sins of those who believe in him. God devised this mean to save mankind. Well, this notion is fundamentally wrong because firstly, didn't God know Adam will sin? Why would he create a man with free will, but at the same time tainted with sin? In that case, what choice does man have but to sin? Secondly, why would God allow his beloved prophet and messenger be crucified in order to wash their sin? As Jesus says on the cross in Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Couldn't God just say, I will forgive the mankind of all their sins if they believe in Jesus? Thirdly, what about people before Jesus who did not even know him or existed in his time, in their time? Are they all doomed because Jesus did not exist in their time? Why would God do this with Jesus only? Why not do it with all prophets and messengers, starting with Adam? By definition, God is able to do anything he wills. Why would he not forgive all mankind from the beginning to the end without Jesus' or other prophets' sacrifice? And even if he did, then the concept of accountability and free will would be meaningless. Is it not rational to think that we all have the potential to be righteous and sinful, and we choose which way? Is it not rational to think that through His grace and mercy, God did not leave us alone, but sent His prophets and messengers from time to time with His revelation to guide us, show us the right path without taking away our free will? Well, according to Paul, it is love of Christ that can save and take mankind to salvation. Otherwise, every man dies in state of sin. This leads to many who are Christians, yet commit sins, some consciously, some subconsciously, doing that which is forbidden or wrong, but believe love of Christ will save them. Perhaps once a week, going to church, kneeling before the pulpit and the cross, or the confession will provide redemption again, based on Christ's sacrifice. Many have been baptized with holy water as a child, yet that holy water does not seem to save them as they will commit sin when they get to adulthood, according to the Catholic Church, due to the spiritual battle. These are not just ordinary people, aside from those who have questioned this doctrine. Among them are the elites, the scholars, the scientists, and big personalities with highest level, levels of education who subscribe to this doctrine and defend it. Why? Because from religious ideological point of view, they are unlearned and just accept whatever they are told without challenging without due diligence. They do not think through the religious evidence and do not contrast. They stay within their comfort zone, that which they inherited from their parents. Whereas faith, any faith, 
cannot be something you inherit or imitate. Rather, something you come to learn and understand, then follow. Following any faith or doctrine must be based on study, proof, and evidence that resonate with common sense and human nature. The Quran asks multiple times, do you not understand, do you not think, do you not ponder, and teaches mankind to follow proof and reason. قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْحَانَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Say, bring your proof if you are truthful. In conclusion, mankind was given the free will through which man chooses to do right or wrong, to commit sin or not. That says man has the potential to sin and or make mistakes. That's in his nature. Some sin more than others. Given this fact, from the Islamic point of view, the Qur'an teaches repentance and reconciliation with God. Direct and sincere repentance in which the sinner pledges to rectify his sinful ways and lead a righteous life, which is a door that is open at all times to all mankind. God's love, mercy, and forgiveness extends to all humanity and depends on man's return to God, his belief, and his right conduct. Islamic view of sin and repentance is very clear and simple, with no mysteries or complications. Sin and repentance are two very personal acts. Contrary to the Christian doctrine of original sin, no sin is ever imposed on a person prior to his or her birth. Adam took full responsibility for his sin, which he personally committed. Having repented, he was simply and easily absolved of it. Any sins committed by Adam's offsprings would likewise be totally personal. The gateway to repentance and forgiveness is open to all, without restriction or discrimination. It is a simple and straightforward concept that puts everyone's mind and heart at rest and inspires man to do his utmost to succeed and save his soul and never to despair or give up. Everyone sh shall be held responsible for what he or she does. These are some of the impressions that the story of Adam evokes as related in the Qur'an. They are rich with meaning and ideas, inspiration and generous advice that can underpin a social system built on virtue and morality. They highlight the significance of such account as we find in the Qur'an and reinforce the Islamic concepts and values on which it is based. These values originate with God Almighty and are bound to lead to Him in the end. God's covenant with man is based on man receiving God's guidance and abiding by its imperatives and principles. The decisive factor is man's choice either to adhere to and obey God's commands or to crave the Satan's, Shaitan's deceptive allurements. There can be no third way. This foremost and fundamental truth is emphasized throughout the Qur'an and it is the foundation on which all human concepts and systems are established. Wassalamu ala man ittaba'al huda.